today I'm going to talk to you about how we balance supply and demand on the electricity grid. So when you turn on the light switch, how does the electricity grid know how much electricity to supply at that instant? So um, I'll be presenting today with uh, Robert and Dave had introduced um, a lot of work that Robert did in the intro on energy storage and flywheels. So we're going to bring some of those concepts into the talk today as well. Okay, so the outline of the talk is as follows. I'm going to start off by talking about our electricity targets for renewable energy sources in, in Ireland and what our fuel mix currently looks like. Um, I'm then going to explain traditionally how electricity was generated in Ireland and how we have this stored rotational energy or this inertia on the grid and how this helps with frequency control. And then I'm going to introduce the challenges that this presents when we introduce more wind energy and then maybe the opportunities that this also presents. Okay, so our EU targets. Many of you might be familiar with the, the 2020 by 2020. So in 2007, the EU agreed um, climate and energy targets for the EU as a whole. And they were broken up into three different categories. You had a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So that's what they were aiming for that by 2020 in comparison with 1990 levels. They were going to aim for a 20% increase in energy efficiency. And the one I'm going to focus on here is that 20% of the EU's energy consumption would be from renewable sources by 2020. Okay, so within that then, different targets were given to each member state in order to achieve this overall target when you average out between all of the countries. And then Ireland's energy target was to achieve 16% by 2020. Okay, looking at Ireland in a little bit more detail. Ireland's target then was broken up into three main areas. So we had an electricity contribution, a transport contribution and a thermal loading contribution. So the target was that 12% of our thermal energy load was to be from renewable sources, 10% of the energy used in transport was to be from renewable sources and the one that I'm going to explain or, or focus on is th that 40% of electricity generated must come from renewable energy sources. Okay, so how are we getting on? This is the fuel mix for electricity generation last year in Ireland. And you can see in, in the orange there that 49% was from gas, coal 17%, peat 9%. And when you add all the renewable energies together, we're at about 26%. So that was last year. And if we look historically, so this is a chart just from 1990 up until very recently. And the renewable energy contribution is shown in green and you can see there that from the early 2000s there was a, a significant increase or started to be a significant increase in the renewable energy contribution and where did where's the renewable energy contribution coming from so in the bottom green there that uh, historically well it was mostly hydro but from the late 1990s early 2000s the um, integration of more wind on on the grid and I don't think that's any huge t surprise to anybody because we see wind turbines going up around the, the country more and more of late and then this graph just shows the installation of wind by year it's no great surprise that that it's increasing and that we are relying on wind to meet our renewable energy targets okay so clearly Ireland is making an effort towards meeting the renewable energy targets and initially you might be thinking oh aren't we great aren't we doing such a good job but wait a minute integrating and this is what I'm going to talk about integrating renewable sources of electricity can cause instabilities and unreliabilities on our grid okay so let me go back and initially then just explain traditionally how electricity was generated in the past so in the past, it would have been from, renew or from fossil fuels. You'd have had coal, oil, gas, went into a combustion chamber. They were burnt. The steam that they produce can push a turbine. You can start turning the turbine. The turbine will turn a generator. So when you have this spinning, and when you have this spinning in a magnetic field, you can get an AC current induced from that. 
the faster the generator is spinning, the more frequent the oscillations of the AC wave. If it's spinning at 50 hertz, or 50 times every second, you're going to have a frequency, or an AC signal, with a frequency of 50 hertz. All right. So that's the way our electricity grid is, is set up in Ireland. We use alternating current, so you have a, a flow of electricity back and forth, 100 times um, uh, switching direction, 100 times every second. So we have a frequency of 50 hertz. So all of the generators that are connected to the grid, spinning at 50 hertz, are supplying this frequency to the grid, or are supplying that 50 hertz frequency. And if all of those generators are... Are, are spinning at the 50 hertz, we say that they're in sync, or we call them synchronous generators. Okay, so in practice, that exact frequency of the grid can vary a little bit around the nominal frequency. So that frequency can fall a little bit when the grid is heavily loaded or if there's lots of demand on the grid. And the frequency can start to speed up a little bit when the demand drops. So that mismatch between supply and demand is what causes that change of frequency. And in the air grid control center, it's that rate of change of frequency that they're watching. So that is what's telling them whether there's a mismatch between your supply and demand. So if that frequency now deviates significantly from that nominal 50 hertz, any of the connected machines, electronics, or the generators themselves can become damaged. So much so that if it deviates outside a critical value, certain loads or supplies will automatically disconnect. This can lead to a blackout. So this ability to maintain a critical or a stable frequency is absolutely critical. And as I was saying, in the air grid control uh, uh, center, they're watching this frequency and watching the rate of change of frequency with time. Okay. So let me discuss a little bit more about stored rotational inertia, right? So when these generators are spinning on the grid, they have rotational energy. They are spinning, as Rob is just demonstrating here. So right, you have these generators are spinning. The faster they're spinning, the more rotational energy you have. This is key now. That rotational energy can be converted to another form. You can convert it to heat if Rob is to slow it down with his hand or to sound. It can also be converted to light, and we'll show you about that in, in a second. Or it can be converted to electricity. So on the grid, if you need to, you can convert some of your rotational energy to an electrical signal and back again. So when your demand is greater than your supply, your frequency can start to decrease. The rotors will start converting some of their rotational energy to electricity, and they will be forming or, or acting as generators. And in the opposite direction, if your demand is less than your supply, your grid frequency can start to increase. But these rotors can now absorb some of that excess energy and start increasing their rotation rate. So. Do you want to explain about it? Yeah. So just like Andrea was saying, when this wheel is stationary, it has zero rotational energy. And once I get it spinning, now it has a rotational energy. The faster it spins, the more rotational energy it has, as per these equations here. But you can ignore the equations a certain amount. Let's say this wheel has a certain amount of energy, one joule. And if I slow that down in 10 seconds, then the rate of output of energy will be approximately one joule divided by 10 seconds, or 0.1 watts. So that's the energy that you can get out of the system. You can demonstrate that as well with this bicycle wheel, so it's also similar. So we can generate energy in the wheel. So we can get the wheel spinning. Now the wheel has rotational energy. And it'll keep spinning because it has that energy. And it'll slow down slowly over time due to drag and friction in the wheel. We can convert that energy to electricity by the dynamo on the wheel. So if I apply the dynamo, it will start to convert it to electricity. And the wheel will slow down quickly because we're now taking that energy, transferring it to electricity, and it'll go into the light bulb. So I'll start the wheel spinning again. 
So you see the light shining and then it dims. So it doesn't stop the minute I stop putting energy into the system. It takes a while before it stops. So this bicycle wheel can act as a type of, a, you can think of it a, a, like a grid. So in a grid you have generators putting energy into the grid. The grid has rotational energy which is stored energy in the grid and then it has a load. And the whole system, the input energy going into the grid and the load or the power that's been converted to light and other things or electricity being converted to light, the input energy and the load should be the same. And if they're the same, then the grid is nicely balanced. But if there's any difference, the rotational energy will make up for it. So if there's a bigger load, the wheel will slow down. And that means the frequency of the grid will slow down. If there's less load, then input energy, the wheel will spin up. And so you have some like this. So the faster the wheel is going, the more energy in the grid. We have less energy going into the grid, we still have energy going to the light bulb. That's how it works. Okay. So what we've shown here is that that inertia or that stored rotational energy of those synchronous generators provides this, this buffering effect to the changes of frequency on the grid. Because those connected rotors can act as generators or motors and can absorb or um, release energy as, as required to keep the frequency stable. So the stored rotational energy is supplied by those connected synchronous generators. And this is key here now. The more stored rotational energy on the grid, the more buffering capacity that you have. And the more likely a return to your nominal frequency will be if a mismatch between your supply and demand occurs. So that stored rotational energy provides the system with this natural stabilization. It's this built in. So then, what about wind turbines? So wind turbines are, are, are spinning. Could, could they not provide this buffering capacity? Well, no. These wind turbines are not necessar necessarily spinning at grid frequency. They're spinning at a rate that is optimum for extracting energy from the wind. And that wind is, is variable. Wind turbines are not synchronous generators. In fact, they are connected to the power grid via power, or power electronics. So you have an AC to a DC and then a DC back to that useful AC signal. So these wind turbines do not provide synchronous inertia to cope with these changes in frequency. So let's come back to our, our targets that we were trying to meet. We're increasing our, our renewable energy penetration. We're, we're, we're increasing the percentage of wind energy. They're replacing some of this some of these synchronous generators. We're now reducing the amount of stored rotational energy on the grid. Now we have less control over our frequency deviations. So let me put this in, in context now, right? What if there is a mismatch, a, a very large mismatch between your supply and demand? Say the interconnector between the UK and Ireland fails, that's 500 megawatts, and our grid frequency starts to fall. We need some stored rotational energy on the grid to try and cope with this. Uh, how much do we need? So we'll say we'll allow 100 seconds before all of these generators stop spinning. So we have a blackout at, the, at that, like that's critical. So the amount of stored rotational energy we need then, energy is powered by time, our power, 500 megawatts, 100 seconds. We would need 50 gigawatt seconds just to, to cope with this before everything stops spinning. So how much do we actually have on the grid? Well, this um, graph here is, is a demand profile that I just pulled off the, the AirGrid um, website just, just the other day. So you, you can, every, it, this is freely available to access for everybody. And it just shows the demand profile for the last few days, the last week. And you can see that in the evening time, the demand drops to about two and a half thousand megawatts and it, it it rises then during the day when everybody gets up and then in the evening time it generally reaches its maximum peak and in this last week that it was peaking up at about 5,000 megawatts and then dipping to about 2,500 megawatts in the evening time. Okay, so let me assume for example that this includes 500 megawatts from that 
uh, generated from the interconnector from the UK. And that interconnector happens to be a non-synchronous supply. So on the grid, when you have 2,000 megawatts of demand or, or, or generation, this, is, com this um, is equivalent to having about 100 gigawatt seconds of stored rotational energy on the grid. Okay. So my demand here was 2,500. That is made up of 500 megawatts of non-synchronous. So even after a failure from that interconnector, I still have 2,000 megawatts of um, synchronous generation. So I still have about 100 gigawatt seconds of stored rotational energy on the grid. Okay. So in our previous example, or, or, yeah, so I have my 500 megawatt um, interconnector failing. So then based on this, I would have 200 seconds before all of my generators will stop spinning because I have my 100 gigawatt seconds divided by my 500 megawatt power failure, I have 200 seconds before all of my generators stop spinning. So my rate of change of frequency, which is what is being or, um, monitored in your air grid control room, is it's dropping from 50 hertz down to zero in your 200 seconds. My rock off, my rate of change of frequency is about a quarter of a hertz per second, approximately. So now, what happens when I introduce more <coughs> wind energy? I'm replacing my synchronous generators with wind energy. I have less stored rotational energy. So in the table here, the top column is for the example I was just talking about. So if I have no non-synchronous generation, so I, I'm not introducing any wind my stored rotational energy will be about 100 gigawatt seconds. My time before everything stops spinning, about 200 seconds. If I'm now at the case where we are today, where we have um, about a quarter of our energy coming from wind, our stored rotational energy here is somewhere between 60 and, and 70 gigawatt seconds. Now I'm down to about 130 seconds before everything stops spinning. And we have further targets to meet. We're going to keep going with this. Say we're up at 80% penetration with our wind. Now we only have 40 seconds. And we keep going down along with that. We'll eventually reach a case where we've only a couple of seconds, if at all, before everything stops spinning. So that was if I have one generator failed, one interconnector failed. What if another one was to fail? OK, so to try and explain this concept a little bit further, we have three trenches here. And we're going to roll a ball down along each of the three trenches. And um, as the ball, ball is rolled down along each of the trenches, which one is more likely to be able to cope with disturbances? Well, it's the one that has the most curvature in it. So as the ball will travel down along, it will have a, a natural stabilization effect on it. Rob is going to demonstrate that now a little bit. OK, so, so this setup here, which you probably can't see too well, so I'll, I'll just lift it up. It has three, three roots, the left, the middle, and the right. And each root has a different cross-sectional curvature. So the, the root on the left here has steep edges. And that's a little bit like there being um, a large amount of rotational energy on the grid. So if the, if the frequency of any one generator shifts a little bit high or low, the rest of the grid will pull that generator back into the nominal towards the nominal frequency. Here we have an example where there's less stored energy in the grid, le less natural stability on the grid, and so there's not as much uh, steepness on the sides, not as much of a want to go back to the middle, and here it's, it's more or less flat. So if we roll the ball down along this slope, it's very easy to keep the ball along the, at, at the nominal frequency. So we don't even have to do much to keep it at that. The, the system naturally stabilizes. Here, where we've less rotational energy in the grid, and we roll the ball down along, it might jump, jump back and forth by more, and so the grid is less stable. And here where, the, where we have something completely flat, we now have to be very careful and have some feedback on the system, like a person watching a screen, watching the frequency change, 
and be ready to pounce and turn on a battery or something just to keep the thing along its route. So this is a very unstable system. Perfect. So as Rob was showing there, we have two trenches that have this natural restabilization effect. And we have one which has no curvature on it and has no natural stabilization on the system. So the more curvature on those trenches represents more synchronous generators on the system, more stored rotational energy on the system. So let me just point out something a little bit further. We were saying as we're increasing the amount of wind energy, we're replacing synchronous generators. We're reducing the amount of stored rotational energy and we'll have less control. We have less synchronous generators. We're going to be relying on a fewer amount of them. So each one of those is going to have to cope more with changes in frequency. It's going to have to accelerate and decelerate more often. It's going to have to introduce, or it will end up introducing more torque, more stresses on each of them. It's going to interfere with their lifetimes. They're going to end up failing. We're going to have further grid instability. Okay, so I've painted a pretty bleak picture. <laughs> What can we do? Like, should we just stop using wind? Go back to our old ways and fire up the old coal and the gas and the, the fossil fuels again? Like, we want to incorporate or integrate more renewables onto the system. Is there anything that we can do so that we still have control over our frequency? Well, there are some things. We can look at other energy storage devices. Okay. So, some energy storage devices, and a, a common example would be a battery. So don't get me wrong here now. Batteries are not spinning synchronous generators. Like wind turbines, they do not have synchronous inertia. But I'm going to introduce you to the concept that they have synthetic inertia. So batteries, yeah, they're a power source. And via some power electronics, they can provide us with that AC signal at that frequency that we require. The issue is that they have response, to our, our, yeah, response times. It takes about half a second for a good, useful signal to come out of them. They do have synthetic inertia. They can give this signal back, they can give a useful signal out again. So this synthetic inertia cannot replace synchronous inertia, but it can provide a backup. So one proposal would be to use batteries in conjunction with your traditional synchronous generators and to incorporate your renewables. You can charge up your battery from the renewable sources of energy like wind or solar. So just as Rob was showing a little while ago, do you want to talk down through it again? Yeah. So this example here is the example where we just have synthetic inertia, so where we're using batteries to stabilize the grid. In that situation, any large event on the grid will just cause the frequency to change a lot, and we won't have enough time, we won't, there won't be 0.5 of a second for the battery to react to bring the frequency back to 50 hertz. This situation here is the conventional situation where the, the grid more or less stabilizes itself. But if we have some real synchronous inertia on the grid so it's partly stable and then we have a battery to pick up to to be waiting at the wings and to be able to restabilize the system if if the ball goes a large distance away um, then that's a good system but the important thing here is there is a slope which means there will be a rate of change of frequency in the case of an event and therefore time for the battery to react if there's no slope, there's no rate of change of frequency, there is a rate of change of frequency, but it's infinite. And so for a small event, the ball could move a big distance or the frequency could change a lot in the grid. What Rob is showing there is that essentially you have two systems with this natural stabilization. And the trench in the middle is that mixture between your synchronous and your synthetic generators, your, your mix between your conventional and your batteries, and that that is your, your compromise going forward to try and incorporate more renewables into the grid. So just to conclude then, Ireland is making an effort towards its renewable energy targets. That's a fact. And I've shown that conventional synchronous generators can provide stored rotational energy, inertia on the grid. And that inertia provides this buffering effect 
to help cope with changes on the grid. So when you replace your conventional synchronous generators with non-synchronous, you're reducing that buffering capacity. So integrating renewable energy sources like wind into our grid is presenting us with, with serious challenges. But what we've shown is that energy storage devices like batteries can provide you with some synthetic inertia as, as a backup to your synchronous inertia. We can incorporate our renewables by charging up the batteries from your wind and your solar so that we can use batteries in conjunction with your conventional generators. Thanks very much. Thank you.